You can look at the clock. Uh, you can hope your oven is telling you the truth. You could follow commands precisely. You could guess. You can gash. You can poke. You can stab. But none of this is necessary when you know the 26 most important temperatures in cooking. Uh, that's what we're we'll talking about today on the Carefree Cooks Code. I'm Chef Todd Moore, and this is the Carefree Cooks Code every Tuesday live at noon Eastern. Here's our challenge. How can home cooks cook freely with creativity, confidence, and pride while ignoring recipes and still impressing themselves and others with what they cook? Well, the answer is found in becoming empowered with how cooking works, using dependable and repeatable methods of cooking that work for any ingredient, for any diet, and any desire, just like chefs do. And we'll know we've cracked it when everyone sees cooking as an exciting and rewarding way to improve their relationships, their lifestyles, and their health through better food and cooking. This is the Carefree Cooks Code. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Welcome back to the Carefree Cooks Code, everyone. It's another Tuesday, and of course, we're live every Tuesday at noon Eastern time. And uh, if you have a question with anything, of course, go to webcookingclasses.com slash help. Well, not anything. Don't like Chef Todd, what's the meaning of life and stuff like that. You're not going to find that. But uh, uh, previous videos, future videos, web cooking classes, memberships, no matter what it is, there's a button for you to click on uh, and you won't have to wait for a response at all. That's the idea. Go to webcookingclasses.com slash help. Uh, let me tell you about the live schedule going on. Also, this is weekly now. And if you're missing any of these cooking, casual cooking segments on Thursdays and Saturdays, uh, don't miss them coming up because I think I'm going to have have to put this on hiatus for just a little bit after July. I've got some stuff going on. All right. So on uh, Tuesday's Carefree Cooks Code, we have a study hall for lifetime members of web cooking classes only on Wednesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. We are doing our casual cooking thing together because we're the Carefree Cooks. We create our own recipes pff, with books. Uh, we bring friends and family together. We learn every time we cook. We create our own cooking style because we're practicing pro methods and you wind up loving your cooking cooking when that happens. And that's what I love about our community. I, I just saw somebody signed on today. Hey, I'm so glad to be here. I'm so excited about joining. That's like 150 people welcoming them within an hour or so. It's incredible what is going on in our community. And you know, one of the most important parts of becoming truly free in your cooking is moving forward on your path to becoming a carefree cook. And one of these things is to stop giving away control of your cooking to all these vague measurements. Think about this. How many times do you look for medium or medium high? Stop it. Stop cooking on medium. Stop listening to recipe instructions that just tell you, don't overcook it. Yeah, no kidding recipe, you know? I wasn't trying to overcook it. Let's stop scratching our heads. Let's stop poking our palms. Let's stop looking at clocks when to tell you when you should stop cooking. That's not the way to do it. The, the way you want to do this is to quantify your cooking as much as you can. And when it comes to applying heat to food, the measurement device is a thermometer. But before we get into that, I've got a what am I for you today? Tell me in the comments section below this thing this thing right here. <laughs> Tell me what that is in the comment section. Yeah, I know there are words on there, but that's obviously not the answer. I wouldn't just put the answer on there, right? Uh, okay, so in the comment section below, what am I? Uh, look, we've been talking a lot about freedom this month. We're expressing it in the clothing that we wear. I've, I've even made this t-shirt to show my pride in being a carefree cook because I reside in the home of the recipe free. That's right. And I'm going to tell you how you can get this shirt for only $10. And that includes a $1 donation to World Central Kitchen. I'll tell you all about that at the end. But for now, uh, today's Carefree Cooks broadcast is going to be one of the most boring shows I've ever done. <laughs> okay. I mean, if you really don't care how cooking works, then it's going to be boring. If you just want the answers, if you just want the recipe, if you just want to be told how to do it and get it over with in five minutes and you're a genius before you know it, then eh, this isn't going to be for you. All right? It might seem like I'm just going to read a whole list of 26 temperatures, but 
Open your mind a little bit. This might be one of the most fascinating times that we have ever spent together because I'm about to share with you the 26 most important temperatures in all of cooking. So what? You know, you might be sitting there going, so what? That seems awful chefy, Chef Todd. Okay. If you can get through just the next few minutes of me reading temperatures to you, I'll tell you what else you're going to get. You're going to walk away with a ton of aha moments because you're going to start to see the relationship between some of these temperatures and some of the mysteries about cooking that are in your mind today. It's so easy to explain so much of cooking when you quantify it. And you know, you might think this is going to be boring because it's just a list of, te- a list of temperatures, but it might be the best time we've ever spent because there are, again, so many answers in this list. You just need to know what to listen for. And a disclaimer, before we get started, don't write me, don't email me with the preciseness of how I'm in precise. I have rounded, okay? I have averaged. I'm trying to give you a general idea of when things happen in the kitchen. Please don't chef me back and say it's actually 164.2 degrees. It's not necessary because ultimately, It is up to you to observe what's going on when you're cooking and make the adjustments for next time. That is the path to carefree cooking, right? Right. Okay, so let's get going with this right away. Let's start at the very bottom of the thermometer. Okay, well, we'll start where it gets really cold and zero degrees Fahrenheit or minus 18 Celsius, this should be the temperature of your home freezer. And you should have a freezer thermometer as well. You've got a lot of money stocked up in that freezer. And if it dove, or I've had it happen to me where I close the freezer door and a plastic bag or something keeps the seal from from, uh, sealing, and then all night long, my freezer is getting warmer and warmer, Uh, zero Fahrenheit, minus 18 Celsius, you should probably have a a freezer thermometer as well. Next temperature, this is where water freezes, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees Celsius. I think a lot of people know this one. Uh, See how many, see how many you know as we go along, right? Most people know that water freezes at that temperature. It's very important if you are ever going to uh, try and gauge if your thermometer is correct or not, you think your thermometer might be off. And you know, most of them are digital these days, but back in the day when I was a chef, they were spring thermometers. I'm, I'm still a chef, but I mean, but when I first got my hands on a thermometer and they had a little nut on the bottom that you would turn the nut. Well, you calibrate your thermometer by putting it in ice water and seeing how close it comes to 32 degrees Fahrenheit or zero Celsius. Next is 38 degrees Fahrenheit, just below 40, or 3.3 degrees Celsius. This should be the temperature of your refrigerator. If you want your food to last longest in the best environment, your refrigerator should be 40 Fahrenheit or below. 38 is optimal. When your refrigerator gets to 42, 43, 44, with each degree of warmth, you lose days of storage on your items. So, You should probably have a refrigerator thermometer too. I do, like you think I'm nuts? This is stuff that protects my investment in food and it gives me the best food when I pull it out to cook it. Nobody likes wilty broccoli. Nobody likes yellow broccoli. You got the idea? All right, here's an important one. This is 40 degrees Fahrenheit or four and a half degrees Celsius. This is the bottom of the temperature danger zone. And we're gonna talk about that quite a bit. The zone, the temperature zone at which bacteria growth is most fertile, that that it grows most quickly. Now at 40 degrees Fahrenheit, four and a half Celsius, this is when bacteria growth begins. Anything below this temperature, it doesn't kill bacteria, it makes it dormant in most ways. At 40 and above, it becomes undormant. And then bacteria can multiply four times every 20 minutes. So if you do some math on that, you can go from like one bacterium to a few million in an hour or two, multiplying that way. Keep it below 40. Uh, Also at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or four and a half degrees Celsius, this is the temperature to safely cool any leftovers within a four hour period. Anyone that's taken serve safe or or, uh, served in a restaurant or been a waiter, waitress, service person, Uh, you might have heard this in serve safe. The chef, if he has a whole bunch of soup or he has some leftovers to keep it safe, it's got to come to 40 degrees Fahrenheit within four hours. Uh, Here's a fun one. 
88 degrees Fahrenheit or 31 Celsius, uh, this is the temperature the chocolate melts. And if you are a chocolatier, not like a musketeer, a chocolatier, if you are a chocolatier, this is a very important temperature for you for tempering, for being able to bring the chocolate back to a crunchy, hard area. And chocolate, I'm talking about chocolate here, real honest to goodness chocolate, not coveture, not candy coating with oils in it. The definition of chocolate is sugar, cocoa butter, cocoa liqueur, lecithin, and vanilla. Five ingredients in real chocolate, which is why white chocolate is not chocolate. Next one, 93 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the temperature at which butter melts. Very important, melting butter, right? And we're gonna talk about this a little bit further because you're gonna see all these temperatures that talk about butter. So uh, next, 98 degrees Fahrenheit, 37 degrees Celsius. This is the temperature of your mouth. Do you now see why butter melts in your mouth? Do you now see why chocolate melts in your mouth? Sure, we're gonna get to some other things that don't melt in your mouth, but that's good that you know 98 degrees Fahrenheit. Ever been sick? Had to take your temperature? Hopefully, orally, take your temperature? It's 98 degrees Fahrenheit. But let me ask you this, what if this temperature changed, right? What if we had to go live on Pluto or something because of, I, I don't know, like uh, some kind of pandemic or something, you know, something science fiction-ish. So we all gotta go live on another planet, but there, our mouths are 102 degrees. Wouldn't that change chocolate? Or other way, what if our mouths are 75 degrees and chocolate never melts in your mouth, butter never melts in your mouth? It's a wicked temperature for a chef, for anyone that likes to eat, knowing the temperature of your mouth and what will melt in it <laughs> is the idea. That sounded weird. Uh, 105 degrees Fahrenheit or 41 degrees Celsius. If you've made bread, if you're dealing with sourdough, perfect temperature. This is where the yeast starts blooming. That's where we want. 110 degrees Fahrenheit, 43 degrees Celsius. This is important for sticking your finger into water or things. This is where human skin burns. And this is why, like, if you put your hand over a, a hot pan, it's not a good indicator of whether that pan is hot or not. Uh, this is why hot water out of your tap seems a lot hotter than it really is. Uh, this is the temperature at which human skin burns. 110 degrees Fahrenheit, 43 degrees Celsius. Uh, you might've heard me talk about this a whole bunch of times in our classes recently. This is the temperature at which eggs accept air best. If you've ever made icings or meringues or uh, uh, buttercreams, things like that, very important temperature. Heck, if you're making scrambled eggs, it's a very important temperature. If you're making popovers, Yorkshire pudding, uh, patis choux, uh, beignets, uh, any of these items that are leavened by egg, very important temperature. 115 Fahrenheit, this is where your chocolate will burn and it gets really grainy. If you've ever burned chocolate, it's terrible. And this is why you use a double boiler to melt chocolate. What temperature does chocolate melt at? Ah, see, you forgot already. You wouldn't have passed the quiz in culinary school. Uh, 125 degrees Fahrenheit, 52 Celsius. This is where we would call proteins pretty rare, all right? This is the bottom at cooking a steak, at cooking pork chops, uh, salmon, things like that. Proteins are rare, 125 or 52. At 140, your proteins are about medium. Somewhere between 125 and 140, you might find your personal steak number. Uh, if you want to know the real keys to grilling this summer, uh, it's in finding a personal steak number. Because once you find your exact steak or hamburger number, then you can cook everybody else's steak perfectly because you've got a benchmark. Your husband likes his more rare. Your son likes his more well done. You know about what those temperatures should be. Really important. Okay, medium. Uh, 140 Fahrenheit and 60 Celsius is also a fully cooked foods safe holding temperature. This is something, again, in Serve Safe and something we teach to chefs that if you're going to make a whole lasagna or a whole pan of chicken and it's going to stay in the warmer until service, so like a buffet service, it needs to be held hot at 140 or above. At 145, you can pasteurize milk. If you can keep the temperature exactly at 145 degrees Fahrenheit and keep it there for 30 minutes, generally it's an industrial steam jacket kettle or something that can do that. You know, you might be able to do it with a, 
one of those sticks, one of those boiling bag sticks, come to think of it. They can hold a temperature pretty quick. But if anybody got their hands on raw milk, if you're living on a farm, that's the way you would pasteurize it. 150 degrees Fahrenheit, 65 degrees Celsius, gelatinization of starches. One of the big four effects of heat on food. This is how a roux thickens liquid to make a sauce. This is how rice absorbs liquid and swells to make rice. This is how you make polenta. This is how you make grits. This is how you make pasta. You search for the gelatinization of starches. So was I right? Is it really boring <laughs> or, or is it really interesting yet? I told you it's going to be one or the other. This is either going <laughs> to seem like I'm just reading or you're going to think it's fascinating. I think it's fascinating because I'm kind of a chef nerd, but that's okay. I got a few of you with me out there. Let's keep going. Uh, what do we say? 150 Fahrenheit, 65 degrees Celsius. We said gelatinization of starches, but this is also the temperature at which egg whites coagulate. Not too many people know that the egg white and the egg yolk actually coagulate, which means stiffen and shrink, cook basically, at different temperatures. Also at 150 Fahrenheit, 65 Celsius, this is when your proteins are cooked well done, let's call it. You can go past that, I call it hockey puck, but uh, well done, generally 150. And remember my disclaimer, I've rounded, you are going to tell me that your well done is 155. Perfect, you've got the idea of the lesson that you have to find your exact number on things like that. Uh, 160 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, 71 degrees Celsius, this is the correct poach in a liquid. Uh, being able to control moist heat as skillfully as you can control dry heat is one of the best things that a chef can do, one of the most skillful things a chef can do, and it's part of my seven skills chef test that we talked about about two weeks ago, if you can really keep something to a poach. So let me bring this home for you. Let me put two of these temperatures together. If poach is 160, 160 to 165, and coagulation of proteins is 165, isn't poaching one of the best ways to like cook a chicken breast? You can't burn something that you poach. You, know, you, you really can't even overcook something you poach. As long as that poaching liquid stays at 165 degrees Fahrenheit and your chicken is 165 in the middle, you can't go wrong. This is the boiling bag stick that chefs used before we had boiling bag sticks. This is just looking at the size of the bubbles in the water. This is just using your thermometer. I, I didn't need a $150 gadget to do that. Uh, 162 Fahrenheit, 72 Celsius. Uh, you can pasteurize eggs this way as well. Again, if you can hold it at that temperature for 15 seconds, all right, you can pasteurize eggs in that respect. Lower than where it will co coagulate, but higher than where it will kill bacteria. That's the idea. Uh, 165 Fahrenheit, 74 Celsius, coagulation of proteins. Now we're talking about steaks and chicken and pork, uh, uh, generally animal proteins, fibrous vegetable proteins act differently. They all act differently. And a lot of them don't stiffen and shrink under that. So mostly we're talking about muscle tissue here. Also 165 Fahrenheit, 74 Celsius, most bacteria destroyed. So we said if you take your stuff out of the freezer and the bacteria starts moving around once it gets to about 40 degrees, starts multiplying, if you can bring it to 165, you can reduce bacteria to a safe level. It, rarely do you absolutely obliterate all bacteria. You know, I'm very careful to say you kill, not to say you kill all bacteria. You reduce it to a very safe level at 165 or 74. Also at 165, 74, if you're in a commercial kitchen or you want to be safe in your home, this is the temperature to reheat those leftovers safely. So if you were handling your leftovers, you cooked it originally to 165 to make sure it was safe. You kept it held hot at 140 on the buffet line or before you fed your family dinner by keeping that warm oven. Then you took those leftovers, you reduced them to 140 or below within uh, 40 or below within four hours. And then if you want to heat them back up, you got to take it from 40 to 165 within four hours or as quickly as you can, basically, without burning it. That is the catering chef's 
temperature mantra. And again, remember I was executive chef at a large hospital. We had logs, temperature logs for safety purposes that we had to fill out all the time. I'll tell you a quick story in the middle of this, just so it isn't as boring as I told you it would be. Uh, when I was executive chef at the hospital, I did one of the cool things that gave me a lot of pride and honestly, a lot of ego, but in full chef whites, big, tall, nine inch hat, I would go up to the rooms and ask people how their meal was uh, and just engage with them, talk to them about it. I mean, imagine six people in the hospital having the chef show up in their room and ask them about their meal. They loved it. There was a big smile. They always told me what they like to cook and what their kids like to eat and so on. But I would always send up one or two dummy trays. In other words, I don't have to explain the production, but hospital trays go up. I would make up two fake patients and the tray would go up there, so I would meet the fake patient tray, and I would take the temperature of all the food. I would cut the food. I would taste the food. I would drink the milk, the little cartons of milk. I would stab them with a thermometer, and we would test the temperatures. It's very important from a safety standpoint, especially at a hospital. Okay, the, the aside, let's get back here. Where were we? Reheat leftover safely. Uh, 185 Fahrenheit, 80, 85 degrees Celsius. This is an appropriate simmer. Simmer is visually characterized by small bubbles around the edge of your pan, slight convection to the liquid 20 degrees above the 165 degrees Fahrenheit that you need to actually cook something, right? So it's a simmer. 185 uh, Fahrenheit, 85 Celsius is also final finish temperature for whole poultry, especially stuffed poultry. Thanksgiving time here in the U.S., if you are stuffing the cavity of your bird, the juices of the bird soak into the stuffing, you need at least another 20 degrees temperature of that stuffed bird or whole poultry where you would take the temperature at the thickest part of the thickest piece, generally between the thigh and breast or the thigh and carcass. So whole birds are 185. 212 Fahrenheit, 100 Celsius, the temperature at which water boils. Yay, you knew two of them. <laughs> you knew water freezes and water boils. Most people do, but it's very important because that's the temperature that your stuff dries out. You know, right? if you're cooking and you're making dry stuff because you're boiling the water inside it, right? Okay, let's talk about sugar. Soft ball sugar stage at 235 or 113. Anyone that wants to make gummy bears or uh, anything like that, or even an Italian buttercream, uh, you can take it to just about this temperature and it almost gives you a little bit chewiness. If you go another 20 degrees, you're gonna get to the hard ball sugar stage and you can cook sugar, evaporate the moisture out of it. You actually take some of it with a spoon. You don't ever touch it because it's like molten lava. You pour a little bit of that uh, sugar, the molten lava sugar into cold water and then you can actually take it out with your hand and roll this hard ball of sugar in your hand. So again, if you're trained as a chef or you're tra trained in the bake shop, yes, you need the thermometer, but you also have a backup of visually the way things are done. Um, I'll tell you something else about softball stage. I used to make croquembouche at the holidays. It sounds like an illness. It's not. Uh, it is a really fancy French table setting. It sits in the middle of the table and they're mini puff pastries filled with cream and they're all glued together with sugar into a, a mountain. You might have seen it before. Uh, the sugar goes to softball stage so that you can glue them together. But then one of the cool things is, and I used to do this all the time, I loved it. You can make um, uh, like a garland for the, the Christmas tree. You dip your spoon into softball sugar and you take two dowels that stick out from a table and you wipe the spoon back and forth. The sugar comes flying off the spoon. You wipe it back and forth like this and you get this hair. It's sugar that is hair thin and you can pick it up and like wrap your dessert with it. It's really cool. I might have to post a picture of that uh, some other time. Uh, next one, soft crack sugar stage. Uh, if you are working with sugar, this is where the sugar becomes harder. This is where you start making hard candy, things like that. Uh, caramelization of sugars, that's another of the four effects of heat on food at 320 Fahrenheit or 160 Celsius. This is when things turn brown. This is when you toast a piece of bread. This is when you put grill marks on your chicken or your steak. It's a very important temperature in the four effects of heat on food. Uh, while we said that butter melts at 93, it burns at 350. 
whole butter burns at 350 degrees Fahrenheit, 177 degrees Celsius. The way you can avoid this is clarify the butter because it's really the milk solids that are going to burn that way. At 360 degrees Fahrenheit, I need to get up there, top of the <laughs> thermometer, 360 Fahrenheit, 182 Celsius, extra virgin olive oil will smoke. This is the smoking point of olive oil. So you're, you're you know, really playing within a short range here when you're talking about caramelization of sugars and then smoking your oil. And that's why being able to control your temperature is so important. Uh, clarified butter smokes at 480 degrees Fahrenheit or 250. So if you're tired of your butter burning at 350, clarify it, and then you've got another 130 degrees Fahrenheit to play with. That, that's what it is. It's the 26 most, they're pretty sharp, huh? Look at that, uh, up and down. 26 most important temperatures uh, that you can find in cooking. And look, I know a lot of people are going to ask me. I can see the screenshots <laughs> going off right now. I know a lot of people are going to ask me for that slide with the 26 temperatures on it. So I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go ahead and uh, post a JPEG image of it, a, a, an image in our Carefree Cooks community. So all lifetime members of web cooking classes can have it, print it out, put it on their refrigerator if they want, um, and they can put it into their cooking as soon as possible. So uh, if you're a lifetime member of web cooking classes, look for me to post that a little later today in our Carefree Cooks community. Uh, you know, it's the type of thing that in culinary school, you would have to memorize all those temperatures. I know I've given plenty of tests on them. As a home cook, it's good to know the hierarchy of things because a lot of times it will explain what has gone wrong. So if you're a lifetime member of web cooking classes, give me a few minutes to post that in Carefree Cooks. Speaking of which, let's see how our Carefree Cooks are using some of these most important temperatures in cooking this week. Uh, Paula made lobster American so cool. Or, excuse me, American with an E on the end of it, just to make it sound a little fancier. Nicely done and a, and a great dish, right, for this week. Lobster American, not an easy dish to do, but she went at it with confidence. Really nicely done, Paula. Good job. Uh, uh, Carol, she used a cooking method that so many people ignore. Steaming right? 212 Fahrenheit, 100 Celsius. People don't understand how great moist cooking is because it takes a, a lot of the mistakes away for you. But she made this amazing chicken roulade. She stuffed uh, chicken with a herby cheese mixture and then she steamed it so it, it's kept moist. And actually steaming will protect your cheese filling a lot more than grilling or roasting will. Uh, Pamela, she made gumbo. Oh my goodness, I love gumbo. And hers, it looks spot on, right? It's really nice and shiny. It has a deep brick color. I don't see any specks of fat like floating around on top. When you get little gl glassine, like reflective specks of fat, it signifies a badly made roux. But that's not this. But, uh, Pamela, and she says that really making the right roux was the difference that ma it made all the difference. She paid more attention to making a great roux and the rest of the dish just fell in place, she said. Uh, Jean shared her very first photo with us. Welcome, Jean. We're glad you're with us. Uh, and as you can see, <laughs> she's already well on her way to carefree cooking. She sauteed boneless, skinless chicken thighs. She deglazed the pan with coconut milk, added a scoop of peanut butter, some brown sugar, curry powder, and red pepper flakes. That's all it has to do, right? It doesn't have to be incredibly fancy. And those are some of my favorite combinations. And, but, but, but this is the part I like the most. She simmered it, she says, simmered until the temperature read 155 on my new thermometer. <laughs> that is what made me happiest, quantifying your cooking. And I think, you know, this is just, she just kind of made it up as she went along. You know, being able to cook this way is really a lot more fun. Uh, Linda says, uh, usually my turkey burgers are dry, overcooked, and pretty much tasteless. <laughs> All right. Harsh on yourself, Linda. I'm sorry about that. But she also says, not since Carefree Cooks, uh, since Carefree Cooks has taught me the method and I add ingredients that I like, it always tastes good with no recipe. Cool. And when you use your thermometer to quantify the results, then you have your own personal burger number that I talked about, right? This is the exact internal temperature that's perfect for you because again, then you can go cook everybody else's burger based on your pen, uh, 
benchmark. That's the idea. Look, th this is the idea. Use your temperatures. Use your quantifiable temperatures and you can end so much of the guesswork in cooking. Uh, let's get back to the what am I? The what am I? What is schmaltz? Anyone know what schmaltz is? It's chicken fat. It's rendered chicken fat. And if you're making stock with chicken, you will get that schmaltz rise to the top. Uh, it's used in matzo ball soup, but it certainly can be used in saute. I don't recommend it for vegetarians, uh, but if you are rendering chicken fat, you can use it to saute something else for sure. Uh, hey, look, if you know someone who's guessing and gashing, yeah, if you know someone who's looking at a clock for cooking answers, oh my goodness, uh, you know someone who has more paper cuts than knife cuts, from cooking with a book, then you should like and share this video with them because having quantifiable temperatures is really empowering. And is this not the coolest t-shirt? Yeah, yeah, I just love it. I designed it. <laughs> it's the home of the recipe free, carefree cooks t-shirt that's gonna be available in July only. And each shirt comes with a $1 donation to World Central Kitchen and Chef Jose Andre who is feeding thousands of people in these very difficult times. And you can get this shirt in white or green for only $10 when you pick up any other item in the new Web Cooking Classes store. So go to webcookingclasses.com slash store to see the items that I've designed and put in there for you. We are going to be expanding constantly. So until next Tuesday, where we take even more steps toward cracking the Carefree Cooks Code, this is Chef Todd Moore reminding you that there's a method to your cooking success. Bye, everyone.